up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are radio for the local craft beer movement. This week we're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios at Ironmonger Brewing in Marietta, Georgia. I'm Tim Dennis. And I'm Brian Hewitt. This week we're talking with Chris Meadows, the head brewer of Knoxville, Tennessee's Elkmont Exchange. And we've got a special guest joining us in the studio, Justin Crandall and his wife, Elizabeth. Uh, they are going to be launching the soon-to-be Hop Soul Brewery in Brunswick, Georgia. Guys, thanks for joining us. Appreciate being here. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate Thank it. You. How was your fourth? Uh, well, there's beer drinking, and it was great. Good, good. Lots of fireworks. Fireworks, lots, and, lots of fireworks. and beer. Yeah, and in Brunswick, bad. lots of water. Lots of yes. water in Brunswick. Yeah. Chris, how about you? How's how's Knoxville's 4th of July? Knoxville's 4th of July was pretty big. Um, we actually did a beer re- cask release special for Elkmont Exchange, and then it pretty much sounded like the entire town was on fire during the fireworks. So, Brian, we had a busy week. Oh, we did. We did yeah. some beer drinking. We did some traveling. We did. As as you do in the, in the quest for beer. We took a little break from our Georgia brewery visiting because we're about two-thirds of the way. Is that right? We're over half. I don't know if we're a two thirds just yet, but yeah. we're getting close. Because we have a mission to visit every brewery in the state of Georgia in 2018. And I think we're like 53 or so uh, right now. And I think I there's 81 counting all breweries Ooh, and breweries. I think so. Close. And you have to be open yeah. by a certain point in time. It's got to be reasonable for us when, to make when it to that, you. When is that Wait, date? When's that date? <laughs> December 1st is our okay. cutoff. Hey, I think so. that's kind of where my accountant is saying See? what we need to be. See? Yeah, <laughs> so. But we decided to do a little run to Tennessee. We went up to Chattanooga. Checked out the breweries there. We went to uh, Odd Side, Odd Story, Odd Story, yeah. Odd Story, Hutton and Smith, which I just found out as a geology reference. Apparently, I had no idea. And then Heaven and Ale. So you know that Hutton Smith was the fifty fiftieth fastest growing brewery in two thousand seventeen. I heard according that. That's to, pretty uh, cool. Something that I read and reported on earlier this year. So that yeah. was kind of neat. They're very close to us, and they made the top fifty. Yeah, because cool stuff. If you go to their tap room, it looks. Uh, unassuming you know just kind of sure. a small place down there but when we went in ways originally took us to their production location which is a lot larger so mm-hmm. but it's all fenced off we're like how do we get in there to drink your beer and then <laughs> we're like well they must have another location so. yeah clearly that was nowhere near town but uh yeah that was that was a good time but there was. um the the at heaven and ale they had that collab with uh with variant called chew high i think that was really good that it, was really good a little yeah. local love there for our friends yeah. over at variant and roswell so that was neat to see on tap up there that was so. good stuff and I, I had a friend come into town and we we got into some uh some of the bigger beers in my cellar like you do you know stouts in of july because yeah. yeah that's it's stout season it's so, stout season absolutely <laughs> i finally broke open a bottle of red bricks hawaiian hype whale that was that's a great that's a good beer. beer that's a really yeah. good beer and you know another one i enjoyed on chattanooga the hop kush at heaven yes. hell was fantastic and uh odd story had a blackberry sage berliner which i loved you said you weren't as big a fan as i was of that one. I, th- I thought it was all right i yeah. thought it was all right it wasn't uh yeah it wasn't quite as great for me but uh they had that wheat wine over across the street from Odd Story, over at, at Hutton, Hutton Smith, Smith, right? And that that wheat wine, I uh, I don't know what's happened to that style, but maybe it's making a comeback. We saw it a few times, and that was that was delightful. good enough to get you to return and buy some to go, right? Yeah, that's right. I went yeah. back and got a couple of bottles after the fact. Yeah, so it's good cool. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then Fourth of July, of course, Brian, we got together. We ate some ribs. We ate nice. some uh, some beef, some ribs. Drank some beers and watched some fireworks, man. Yeah, it was cool. It was all, cool. All a good time. All from a parking lot. Well, not all of it. Not all of it. Yeah. Some of it. Yeah. yeah. Chris, did you uh, get into anything interesting this week? Um, other than working, not not so much. No. <laughs> a busy time for holiday weeks keep you busy when you're at a brew pub, right? It's a very yes, sir. Very very busy. Yes. You know, Tim, I think it's time for truck and tap spears of the week. Crack open a cold one. It's the truck and tap beer of the week. <laughs> Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Brian, as always, we've got a lot of awesome beers to drink. We did a little pregame in here with uh, one. It was a strawberry milkshake IPA, and I can't remember the name of the brewery. Off Square? Sounds possibly right. But it was tasty. Nice strawberry flavor in that. You know, of course, we always have a couple Ironmonger beers when we come up here. But a few of our featured ones this week, we are going to get into Southern Prohibition's Paradise Lost. That's a double IPA. We have a Dead Beach Brewing. It's a milkshake IPA, Brian, with appropriately appropriately named 
I could teach you, but I'd have to charge. <laughs> so we're also yes. going to get into Southbound Brewing's Mountain Jam, which is a really nice pilsner. And we've got a three taverns crave here that we're going to get into. They look delicious. All of them are yes. going to be good. So now let's see what's happening in the news. What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. So we're over halfway into the year at this point, and uh, Kraft's uh, beer sales have been reported their growth halfway through the year. They've only grown 1.7% as of the halfway point. This figure comes from a market research firm named IRI Worldwide, and it's based on off-premise sales of craft beer in large retail and chain stores, I think around the world. They didn't specify there's still some growth in craft beer, but uh, the figure seems to indicate that the growth is slowing, which is what we've been hearing for a while. Unfortunately, several big craft beer names are actually on the decline. New Belgium and Deschutes are both down over 10% year to date. And the uh, the one-time market dominating fat tire, wow. I can't believe this, is down 20% right now. We were just talking about wow. you making a run to Chattanooga to get that. That's exactly that right. Point. When it yeah. first came up there, I, 2006 maybe, uh, it was, yeah, you'd make a run for that. It was, it was great. There's some breweries that are doing really well. Boston Beer Company is up 16% thanks to Angry Orchard Rosé Cider. So they're up, but not thanks to beer, which is interesting. Okay. Founders is up 51.4%, which I think has to do with their solid gold lager. I, Interesting. Astronomical growth. That's huge. Yeah. Packs, yeah, packs. Yeah, is that yeah. that big yeah. pack? Exactly. It's yeah, a big people case. Like a, like people a love that big case off that. Because they keep wanting to drink it. And I think the most exciting one that's up is Sweetwater. They're wow. up 4.20%. Uh, it's got to be, man. It's got to be. I swear. I swear that that's it. Stone, Firestone, Walker, Oscar Blues, and Dogfish Head are also up. You know, uh, but we're a seeing, good too. you know, well, that's interesting because some of those are big, big guys growing. Sure. The founders growth, 51%. That's massive. Huge. Because they weren't a small brewery at the beginning of the year anyhow. Yeah, so, that's impressive. But, you know, we're seeing folks going to more places like like Elkmont Exchange, you know, the, yeah. the neighborhood, the the local and hyper-local. That's that's where we're seeing a lot of the growth now. Yeah, so, yeah so they're uh, talking about the big squeeze happening right now. Yeah. So uh, big brewers and small brewers are basically squeezing in the middle. The guys in the middles are getting pushed out. And, you know, either you're, you're hyper-local or you're a big guy like Bud Miller Coors buying up craft brewers and you're coming in and distributing beers and, you know, it's tough. Yeah, that's tough for regional Crazy brewers. Stuff. It's yeah. a tough market when it's everybody's popular, the whole thing is popular. So we have a quick update on the recent Beavertown sellout drama. Half of the breweries that were going to attend the Beavertown Extravaganza 2018 have pulled out. And this is a message according to uh, a post they put out on their website to people who had purchased tickets to attend. The show is going to go on, which actually I didn't think was going to happen. And Beavertown has said that they will have contacted all the the participating breweries that are still on board and they're still on board as of what they know at, at this point. So you about 50% of the original. Yes. But about 50%, ones, right? like yeah. of the ones that are still there, they contacted them, gave them their story and all that. So half that have pulled out the half that haven't said they're pulling out, will be there pouring beer. The uh, ticket holders will get an automatic 20 uh, pound refund. So it's, it's the UK. So it's pounds, not dollars. And uh, people who want a refund have two weeks to do so, and they can get a, a, a complete refund. So it seems like they're handling the situation better than Wicked We did with their Invitational. And they also mm-hmm. didn't sell out completely, so they're, they're only a, some margin of sell Still out. seeing some fallout, though. Still yeah. having to do a little damage and control I'm curious, there. I'm curious why they don't just say how much they sold out, but maybe it's a big number. Or, I don't think I don't any know. breweries ever really, you know, they don't want to say that. They just say minority. They'll say minority, majority, or full sellout. Yeah, it's all they said is is a minority stake, so it could be forty nine percent or it could be five. No, there's no telling. So we got some interesting uh, beer history news this week. Ancient beer history. We found some evidence of brewing in Sweden back sixteen hundred years ago, uh, and we also have some Hittite brewers in Turkey that were brewing very sophisticated beers four thousand years ago. Craziness. They were using bittering agents before hops were even domesticated to that's pretty I can't cool. even believe this. That's what I saw the thing about the uh the one with the Swedish brewery and they, you know, someone's like, Well, we know beer was being brewed much longer ago than that. We're like, Yeah, but it's still really cool to find evidence in a new area. And there, this is so. before Vikings too. Yeah. Pre Viking beer. Indeed. Interesting stuff. If you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show, we do need to take a quick break, but we'll be back right after this to talk with Chris Meadows of Elkmont Exchange.
If you love wild, sour, and barrel-aged beers, be sure to check out the amazing offerings from Sweetwater's Woodlands, the Atlanta Brewery's barrel-aging facility. For the serious craft beer fan, the Woodlands Circle Beer Club offers members six unique exclusive bottles plus other great perks. Series 2 is starting soon with more creative offerings from Cellarman Nick B. Visit the Woodlands in Atlanta, Georgia, follow Sweetwater Brew on social media, or get more information and sign up at sweetwaterbrew.com slash club. That's sweetwaterbrew.com slash club. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Cannibal! Cannibal coming. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. And welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. For more great craft beer info, visit us on the web at beerguysradio.com. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios at Ironmonger Brewing, and we're talking with Chris Meadows, head brewer from Elk Mod Exchange in Knoxville, Tennessee. Chris, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Good thing, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good to have you. Now, this is, uh, isn't your first beer rodeo, Chris, and we know you from a previous venture of yours when you worked for Sweetwater here in Atlanta, and we actually talked to you and Troy Montrone, at uh, Sweetwater's uh, Sweetwater's Woodlands. That's correct. Yes, I remember that. Good time. So, can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, craft beer journey there? What uh, what got you to Knoxville? Okay, sure. Well, as you stated, I work for Sweetwater. Uh, I actually worked for them for about eight and a half years, and I um, trained a lot of their employees for a good amount of time, and then also helped Troy develop the Woodlands project. And my experience with all of those parts of uh, Sweetwater led me to meet some people here in Knoxville that were opening a brewery and restaurant. And um, it's a pretty cool little project here that has, uh, we have a 10 barrel mash filter system. We have uh, 11 fermentation tanks, two fooders, and we have a bar that has 24 different taps and all of the beers are ours. That's Very impressive. Good yeah. That's yeah. impressive. And Troy's actually moved on. Sweetwater can't keep the good people. They, they Chris. cannot. Yeah. You guys, it's pretty tough. You guys keep leaving, but you know what? Good for Sweetwater because it seems like they train people up and encourage them to go do something else. Because Troy is actually at uh, Crooked Stave That's now. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. So I think, if I remember, is he brewing operations and cellar manager there? Is that right? I, I am not sure what he does there, but I know he is a big part of what they're doing there now. So how did you get connected with the folks at Elk Mon Exchange? Um, I had actually met this uh, gentleman named Alex Violet, who used to work for Upslope Brewing Company in Colorado. I uh, met him at several different craft brewers conferences throughout the years. And one day I just kind of called him up and said, hey, I'm looking to kind of branch out and get out of Atlanta. And uh, let me know if you have something going on soon. And he's from the Knoxville area. So he actually, in that same conversation told me that he was thinking about opening a, a restaurant up here where it would have its own brew house. And uh, we kind of took it from there. Now, were you familiar with Knoxville uh, before you went up there? Or was this just a, a jump in and see what happens? It was a totally jump in and see what happens situation. <laughs> yeah. So two of your founders started uh, a brewery in Vietnam. Is that right? At Pasteur Street. But uh, they're actually from Knoxville. Uh what what happened there? Do you how much insight do you have on that? Um, I I wasn't there, so I don't know like all the details. But the uh, the original executive chef of Alcmon Exchange, he's one of the founders. His name is Ryan, and then Alex, he's the brewmaster. They came together and they grew up here in Knoxville, first of all, and then before they went off and did their own things for several years, they uh, just kind of had a, a good relationship, I guess, where when it was time to come home. They did their own thing. But before they came here to Knoxville, they went to Vietnam, like you're discussing. Um, I don't know exactly who started that project, but they ended up in Vietnam. They did really, really well. And they met some investors here in Knoxville that wanted to open this restaurant here. 
So after they both had met their significant others and had children, they decided to move home to America and no better place than their hometown. Now, Brian, wasn't past your street at Shelton Fest? Weren't they one of the ones there? They were, I think they were slated to be there. I'm, I, I can't remember if they, okay. there was one brewery it seems that like I've had it, them before that, yeah. that were here. Well, so. here's the, th- I think, uh, I think they had some beer featured there. Yeah. yeah. It, the interesting thing with Pasteur Street is I went to a brew fest in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur and Pasteur Street was there and it blew my mind to drink a Saison from Vietnam. So I'm kind of curious <laughs> with, so wait a minute though, Brian. So you were in Kuala Lumpur. Yes. Drinking Saisons from Saigon. Yes. From people from Knoxville. That is correct. Okay. And now I'm talking and now right. I'm talking with the guy who brews beer okay. for them. All right. I'm kind of curious if any of the recipes got brought over, if they're like, you know what, we had these great recipes from Vietnam. We wanna we wanna, you know, influence some of our, our beer. I'm like, is there is there any influence on that? previous experience or is Elkmont just completely separate? From- it's mostly completely separate. Um, there's definitely been a few recipes that Alex has contributed to, but for the most part, we are doing our own thing here in Knoxville. We are not trying to do the same things that they did over there in Vietnam. So the beers that they brewed over there, and again, I know we're asking you questions about things you weren't involved with, but uh, we thought you might know. They, I saw that they were an American style brewery, but do you know, did they, tweak their brewing methods or, or styles to appeal to the, you know, the local Vietnamese market? No, I think that from, from my understanding, they were one of the first kind of American style craft people overseas that were, were doing that in that area. And they were, they weren't making beer in a non-American craft way. They were taking the American craft beer spirit and using the local ingredients like locally grown coconuts or locally grown fruits and trying to kind of make, express their beer in, in the true American craft style, but also sell it for the first time in Vietnam as, as it is not, not watered down, not, you know, mass produced, not uh, typical of that region, I guess. Interesting. Cool stuff. So let's go to uh, like Elkmont and focus on that. What, what's the brewing program? Is there, what's the philosophy behind Elkmont uh, exchange? What, what are you looking to do with your beer there? Um, right now we're, we're trying really hard to, provide a focus on our facility itself. Uh, Like I stated earlier, we have a mash filter. So that's one of the big parts of our recipe formulations because of that process. Chris, what is, what is that? What is the, when you say the mash filter, I think I may know what you're talking about, but let's assume that I know what you're talking about, but no one else does. (laughs) So for all of those that don't understand, can you explain that? Sure. So, so typical brew processes are uh, you, you crack the grain husk, You get it wet, you make your mash, then you transfer it to the false bottom louder ton. And you use that, the husk and the bottom of the louder ton to form a filtration bed. And that's where you pull your clear work from. What makes the mash filter different is we actually have a hammer mill. So we pulverize our grain into a flour. We mash in just like any other brewer would. But then we have this giant uh, horizontal machine that kind of looks like a, a big, oversized small filter press, I guess, that you would normally clean up your finished beer with. And um, we, it has screens inside, so we're actually able to force the, the, the mash through it. And on the other side, clear work comes out. Um, we actually use pressure to, to push through, uh, whereas normal, normal brewing situations, you use gravity to kind of let the work fall through. Do you have to take special considerations with that to avoid astringency? Uh, yeah, there definitely are some things. Um, one of the things that's that's neat about this process is that's the first question everyone asks. That if, if they know anything about brewing, that's typically the first question that gets asked is why why don't you get astringency in your beer? Um, and the, the typical answer is we sparge so little because we're able to extract every bit of sugar. Okay. Um, typically, when you sparge for a very long time or for very hot temperatures that's when you're starting to pick up a lot of the grain astringency. And in our case, we can make a 10 barrel batch of beer and we've only sparged 30 gallons of, of water um, because we're able to actually squeeze squeeze okay. that press and get every last drop of sugar out of there. And from, if I remember correctly, you actually, your efficiencies are higher. You get a smaller footprint with the brew Correct. house. Is it that uses, right? It uh, uses about a third of the water that normal brew houses do. 
um, just because we have to spart so little and our grains, when we, when we give them to the farmer, they weigh half as much because they're not, they're not wet. Uh, most of spent grains weight is, is water. Well, very cool. Very cool. Um, that's, I, I, I don't think I'd ever heard of that before. It, in well, the, I'm in wondering the, if that's similar to, have you seen Reformation's brew house? Yeah, they have something very similar. I think they have an IDD system, I believe. Um, but it's, it's basically the same thing. Interesting. It's a, it's a cool concept. Yeah. And I think I asked them the same thing about astringency, just because as home brewers, we're told, you know, especially if you're doing like a, a partial extract, you know, don't squeeze don't, your grains. Yeah, don't, don't squeeze sure. that. Yeah. Don't over sparge. <laughs> don't squeeze. So it just seems like it's set up to have some issues there. Well, we do need to take a quick break. We've got plenty of more questions for you, Chris. Okay. If you're listening to Beer Guys Radio Show. We'll be back very soon to talk more with Alcmon Exchange. Are you thinking about opening a brewery in the Atlanta area? If so, take a look at the park at Georgetown. This unique community will feature a collection of restaurants as well as a craft brewery located within the new JW Homes Luxury Development, Dunwoody Green. Conveniently located less than half a mile from I-285, this enclave of restaurants will be the gathering place in Dunwoody. Trim and Associates, the developer of the park at Georgetown, wants to talk to you. For more information, call Stephen St. Paul at 404-256-2960, extension 5. That's 404-256-2960, extension 5. We are Reformation Brewery, celebrating the reformer in you. Locally crafted within the renowned Etowa watershed of Woodstock, Georgia, Reformation creates yeast-forward brews full of aroma and flavor crafted to last. Come see us in beautiful Woodstock, Georgia, for a tour and tasting of unique brews that you can't find anywhere else. Reformation Brewery, set beer free. ReformationBrewery.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I believe you have my stapler. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout-out to one of our great radio affiliates, WTKI on 1450 AM and 92.9 FM. Catch Beer Guys Radio on WTKI on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Central. That's in Alabama. Uh, We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Ironmonger, we're talking with Chris Meadows, head brewer at Elkmont Exchange in Knoxville, Tennessee. We are, Brian. All of that you just said is true. <laughs> Every bit of it. Every yes. bit of it. Chris, Chris, we were talking. We had to uh, interrogate you about your brew house just before the break. Yes. And I think we've got all the info we needed to, uh, for now, out of you for that. But uh, we'd like you to be available for further questioning in the future about the brew house. I'm here. I'm always here. Man, we want to talk about your beer a little bit more. And uh, I noticed you have Fooders there, which is not something that's yeah. overly common for a brew pub. You know, space is valuable in most brew pubs. So to get a couple of Fooders in there. But uh, are you working on developing a sours program for Elkmont? Yes. We've actually already released three different sours. Uh, we have two 40 barrel Fooders in house. And we, uh, first few weeks we were brewing, tried to fill them up and get them going. So we've been open about eight months, but about a month ago, we released our first actual fooder sours. What was that one? Um, well, the we two different fooders. So we actually released three beers. One was a fooder Brett Saison that we dry hopped. And then the second one was a full on like a light brown, dark golden colored sour. And then we released that as its own thing. And then the third one we released was we actually added some fruits and some spices to the sour base and the food or saison based and blended them together in uh, certain proportions. So we have three on draft right now. So you are blending the beers out of the fooders. That was one of my questions. If you were doing, you're taking the, the that volume and doing some blending, some interesting things where you introduce things to them. So you are doing that then? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, a big part of any wood program or barrel program is blending. That's, I noticed, uh, I was kind of looking up, you know, all the beers you guys had done and you know, we're talking here that you're eight months old, and I saw, according to Untapped at least, you guys have already re- released 76 beers. Yeah, we've released quite a period. few. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna, we're you're gonna run out of space. Untapped's gonna start charging you extra for all the beers <laughs> there. So we noticed the, your core beers. No fooling around with crazy names for those. You've got Monte Grain IPA, IPA, Brown L, Double IPA. So people know what they get when they come there, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah, we're trying to reserve, I guess, right now, the, the special names for collaborations and just really, truly special projects. And in terms of our customer base, we're really trying to focus on the fact that these beers are specific styles. Um, we're trying to let that kind of take precedence before we give them true personalities, if, if that makes any sense. Now, with the multi-grain IPA, uh, kind of interesting name for that one. Uh, tell us about that. What makes it a multi-grain IPA? Okay, sure. So we have two different regular IPAs on. The, the normal IPA is just a simple Maris Otter malt bill and specific hops that we've chosen for that beer. What makes the multi-grain IPA so special is it includes um, heavily, like huge amounts of flaked things like flaked oats, flaked wheat, flaked rye, flaked barley, raw wheat. Um, it's, it's a huge recipe grain bill that's built specifically to showcase the fact that we have a mash filter. So what it allows us to do is it allows us to, to make this, this crazy, crazy malt bill of a, of a beer, but we don't have to worry about any problems in the louder ton with proteins or haze. That's what I guess the original purpose of the multigrain IPA was, was to showcase the, the muscle of the mash filter. So what would you taste in that as opposed to like your straightforward IPA like you add all of these different malts to it. What what are you getting in the final resulting beer? Um, it's it's really hard to explain, but you get you get a little bit of a you know the, the rye really shines through the fluffy pillowy feeling. The mouthfeel shines through of all the flaked oats and the wheat. Um, we use a lot of Belgian biscuit as well, so it gives us a lot of like kind of graham cracker complexity in the mouthfeel. Flavor wise, it's really it's it's kind of styled like a hazy IPA in the sense that it's very low IBU and most of the hops are all on the cold side once they're actually done fermenting or mid fermentation versus our regular IPA, which is pretty traditional in terms of a West Coast IPA and how it's hopped. So I was also looking through some of your other beers that you've you've released on Untapped, and there's one that's called Botanical Rye Farmhouse Ale, and it, it seems <laughs> pretty crazy. And I figure there has to be a story with that. And I, I, off the top of my head, I don't actually even remember what all went into it, but it was a very unusual recipe. What, what happened? Yes. There? How did that come to be? Um, well, it originally started as this idea um, of a collaboration with the local apiary. These uh, Rosecomb apiaries, they're here in Tennessee and they, they grow bees and they collect honey and sell honey as a product. So I, I hit them up when I first moved to town and said, hey, can I buy some of your honey? And they said, absolutely. And I'm a big fan of rye in my beers. So I really wanted to make a, a brown ale that had some rye. And I thought, what better way to make it really special was to add some local honey. So we used a lot of local honey. They actually also gave us bee pollen, which I've never had before. Um, but they, we used bee pollen, lavender, rosemary. Uh, I believe there was lemongrass. And I feel like I'm forgetting something else. There's probably one or two other small things in there, too. So does the bee pollen actually impart anything to the beer? I, I don't think that I've noticed any flavor from it. Um, I mostly taste the honey and the rye. Now, that's does one of those superfoods, right? The bee pollen. That's bee something pollen. people take as a supplement. Yeah. To, uh, Doesn't it help with allergies because the, the bee pollen, yeah. you're gathering the pollen. So it's like, uh, sure. it's like vaccination. I think that's what they, they kind of touted it as. Right? Yeah, like if you take a little bit every day during a season, then maybe you'll acclimate to the local pollen problem and not... El- you know, having a reaction to it. It's the poor man's allergy in, uh, <laughs> shot. I get poor allergy shots, shots yeah. and those are very effective. I have not, I have not actually seen my allergies go down from eating honey yeah. as nice as <laughs> honey is. If, uh, if that's the poor man's allergy shot is drinking beer with bee pollen in it, I'm going to go, go poor man's route on this one. Yeah. That's okay, super so. poor man's. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm taking my medication. We're all good here. It's my allergy medication. You had a lot of other interesting looking beers on there, Chris. Sounds like you've got creative with a lot of stuff. I noticed a Norwegian farmhouse ale with butternut squash. Yeah. And uh, that that's an interesting one. Uh, what kind of flavor did you get out of that one? Because I know Norwegian farmhouse ales is, I guess, a variation of the Saison or farmhouse, but right. the Norwegian specifically has a unique flavor profile, correct? Correct, yeah. And uh, I guess to give you a little backstory on that beer itself is we, we are part of a restaurant, so we have a couple of chefs and we have a butcher. We actually have a charcuterie program, too, that takes takes whole hogs and turns them into different products. Uh, like sausages and bacon and um, induja. If you know anything about charcuterie, it's a pretty wide open subject in terms of what 
what they can do with the meat, but it's basically a way of preserving meat with spices and flavors so that you can eat this meat at a later date and time. It's kind of similar to brewing in the sense that you inoculate it, you add sugar, you monitor its pH, its oxygen, all these different factors to make the final product. And so that, that beer itself came out as um, a byproduct of our charcuterie beer pairing dinners that we were doing. So I, I got together with the chefs and was like, hey, let's, let's make a beer that pairs well with some things that you guys are doing. What are you interested in right now and what's really available for us? So they gave us a whole bunch of butternut squash. We diced it up, coated it with brown sugar, baked it in our oven, and then we put that in our basically in our mash. It kind of gave off this, uh, I guess, really interesting. Uh, it's kind of like a sweet potato type flavor. It's it's hard to really describe, but it's not sweet because a lot of the sugar is fermented out. What made it really interesting was we also added coffee. And we also added um, some green peppercorns to that beer. And then, like you said, we fermented it with a, a Norwegian farmhouse strain called Voss Kvik. So it ferments really, really hot. It was 85 degrees. The fermentation was done in about four days. And it just made this really incredibly complex, clean tasting beer. Just despite all the things we put in it, it's, it's, it's amazing how you can actually notice all the different compartments to the, to the recipe, but they don't they don't dominate in any way. It's kind of this really well-rounded, I don't know how to describe it. It's just really well-rounded in terms of flavor. Yeah. That's, I've really been wanting to try the Norwegian farmhouse out. Sounds very cool. Well, we need to take another break. You're listening to the beer guys radio show. We are talking to Elkmont exchange out of Knoxville, Tennessee. When we get back, we're going to talk more with Elkmont. We're also going to hear a little from uh, hot soul brewing out of Brunswick, Georgia. We'll be right back. It's Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock and Alpharetta are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks daily, so that way you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and coming soon to Duluth in 2018. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. The Old 320 Beer Fest returns to Max Lagers in Atlanta, Georgia on July 21st, 2018. Attendees can enjoy unlimited beer samples from over 30 of the best southern breweries, an orphan bottle share, a chef's tasting room with gourmet bites from brewed to serve chefs, and live entertainment from grateful dude and friends. Plus, enter the raffle for a chance to win an ultimate beer tour of Belgium and Germany with Brutopia events. Find the old 320 Beer Fest on Facebook or Fresh Ticks for more info or to purchase your tickets now. the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram back off man i'm a scientist now back to the beer guys radio show welcome back to the beer guys radio show make sure to follow us on the socials beer guys radio on facebook twitter and instagram we're broadcasting from the beer guys studio at Ironmonger brewing and we're talking with chris meadows of elkmont exchange plus we'll wrap up and talk a little with justin crandall about hop soul brewery good times brian yes indeed and indeed you know we've drank some good beers tonight we have yes. and we had uh, someone brought us uh i believe it was new holland's 20th anniversary beer that they did yes they did a rum barrel beige rum barrel aged beer you can tell how strong it Baged, was by yes. the fact that i'm sorry but uh that was tasty <laughs> that tasted like a, a whiskey almost and i, I want to give a shout out to my buddy tony Cassis from uh, el paso for our, the dead beach brewing in el paso the i could teach you but i'd have to charge hazy milkshake ipa that was nice. It was tasty. Yes. We've got some good beers going going here. So, well, Chris, when we broke there, we're talking about your beers, and we want to talk more about your beers here. We you want sure to actually were. talk to you a little bit about collaborations because we see you guys have, have done quite a few of them, but you, you mentioned during the break you've actually got a very cool collaboration in the works right now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, we've got a few in the works, but one of the ones that I'm most excited about is with a local band called Whitechapel. They're actually out on tour right now they actually tour the country for a couple months at a time they're a heavy metal band and some of their founding members are from knoxville the the bassist for the band is a home brewer himself so he's really into craft beer 
And they came by and wanted to make a pretty metal sounding beer, but also wanted it to be pretty approachable. So they wanted to do a hazy IPA with jalapenos. And um, we actually, as part of our bar program, we, we juice our own citrus every day for our mixing stations for all our cocktails. And we've been freeze drying all of the peels, so orange peel, lemon peel, lime peel, for a few months. And we decided to break all those peels out and use them in this beer. So overall, it's quite a complex array of ingredients for this heavy metal. Oh, beer. That's interesting. The heavy metal band would want to make something somewhat approachable. They're like we want this approachable. <laughs> so did maybe they, they have, maybe have they have approachable metal? I, I don't know. I, maybe they do. Maybe. Did, Maybe that's the new that's a new that's genre. It. I think approachable, approachable metal. metal. School teacher listens to metal. If you yeah. haven't named the beer, I think we just named it for you, Chris. Approachable metal. Approachable. approachable. Let me write there that down. Go. Approachable. So, metal. did you juice the uh, the the hot peppers to put in there? Because I heard something about juicing and hot peppers, and I'm like, could you juice hot peppers? Because that would be pretty amazing. No, actually, what we did was um, we have uh, as part of our mash filter system, everything still runs through a grant um, before we send it to the to the kettle. And our, our grant is designed as a, it's actually sold as a hot back for small little little brew pubs. So we have we put all the jalapenos in the grant. Um, it's like 20 pounds fresh jalapenos. And so we ran all of the wort through that during our loudering process and then boiled that wort. And then as part of the whirlpool stage, we put all of those citrus peels in sacks and put them in our whirlpool and then basically transferred all of the hot wort from the kettle to the whirlpool and let it steep on about 60 pounds of citrus peels. I like to get to know uh, a brewery based on, you know, a flight of their beers. If I were ordering a flight of beers at when I went to Elkmont Exchange, which flight, what beers would be good in that flight? What would be a good introduction or a good get to knowing, get to know the brewery type of uh, flight? What oh, would gosh. you recommend? Um, well, I can only speak for my own personal preferences here, but I think that um, number one, you got to try our light lager. We have a craft lager that's 4.2% ABV made with all Bohemian Pilsner. And then second, I would say you've got to try the multigrain IPA. I know there's quite a jump between those two, but since we've got 24 beers, it's kind of going to be all over the place. Number three, I would say uh, the dry hop fooder Saison has probably become one of my favorites. And then number four, um, that's probably a tougher one. I think I would say we have a beer on draft right now called the Postmodern Funk. And I think that would be a good way to kind of round out that segment. It's a collaboration with a local distillery where we made a mash with them with smoked malt, rye, a bunch of other stuff. And they, they took that mash and distilled it into whiskey. And we actually fermented the same mash on five different strains of Brett and dry hopped it like an IPA. So I'd say that'd be the the four I'd like you to try if you came by. Sounds like a good plan. Just try them out. See what you like, right? Very good. Well, Chris, I wanted to talk a little bit. We're about to to wrap up here, but uh, I have a lot of interest in your charcuterie program. So you guys are pretty serious about that, right? If uh, looking at some pictures, there's charcuterie hanging in various places around the brewery, but uh, you guys do it a lot. Pretty serious about it there. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, a full-time position. We have a chef on board who's a butcher. He's one of my good friends. And uh, his whole job is centered around ordering whole hogs from a local place called Bear Creek Farms. And then we, we take that hog and break it down into pieces. We have a smoker out back, so we smoke a lot. We have house-made bacon, um, lots of different salamis, um, pepperones and we take those charcuteries and we actually um, we sell a couple of different dishes that are basically charcuterie and cheese plates that pair with the with the beers we've got and we've also got an extensive sandwich menu that's each sandwich has um, some some of the parts from the charcuterie in it we have a blt that has some soprasada from the charcuterie room as well as our house smoked bacon um, so it's it's quite an interesting experience to see a little bit of charcuterie in every sandwich and every piece of the the entrees or every piece of the menu itself. I wouldn't be mad about that. I'd be totally okay no, with that. So let's put it this way: I've I've gained twenty pounds since I started working <laughs> yeah. here, and I've tried very hard not to. But you can't. The chef walks out and says, "Hey, you got to try this," or "Hey, you got to try that." Just just like any brewer would when you go visit them. Then you've got to try it, man. Yeah, you, it's insulting not to. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Chris, thanks for the info, man. Hang in here with us. But we're going to talk to Justin and Elizabeth Crandall a little bit about Hop Soul Brewery. 
you're coming to the Golden Isles of Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia, yeah, correct? That's right. So, yeah, Brunswick, uh, Georgia. And you know, we found out on the break, you and Chris actually uh, got some brewing education at the same yeah. uh, edu- uh, institution. Is that's that why, right? That's why I'm stopping by here. I'm about to fly out to uh, Your Vermont right. and get my American Brewers Guild training finished and be done with that. I've been uh, waking up at 5 a.m. in the morning and watching a ton of videos. And I'll be glad when that's past me. Ask me so I can go Done back with to that the brewery. Part. Yeah, go back on up there. So I've got to. I'm going to start off with a question that I find the most interesting, or something I want you to tell Shoot tell it. us about. Yeah, you have an extremely interesting location <laughs> for your brewery. In Just a little bit. So tell me about where you're building your brewery. So we're taking an old uh, Shoney's off of it, an exit off an I-95, and turning it into a brewery. And um, you know the the reason for that is that um, a lot of restaurants actually have a lot of infrastructure already there for breweries. If you're, you know, you're doing a smaller kind of brew pub system. So we're doing like a 10 barrel system and uh, it had 2,500 square feet of kitchen space, floor drains, three phase power, gas, everything you need pretty much for a brewery. Um, So we're basically just going to remodel the space, remodel the dining room, put in the bar, plop in the brewery system. And then we actually had extra room for the pizzeria that's going to go in there. So we're going to, we're going to make our own pizza, hand make our dough. Uh, We're doing a lot of cool stuff with the food side of things too. So. Very cool. Yeah. And so, who doesn't like 90s Americana <laughs> Rethat, right? Got yeah. you. Now, I don't know if you know this, but uh, <laughs> the pro wrestler Big Papa Pump oh, purchased the Shoney's in Ackworth, Georgia, uh-huh. and installed a beer bar there. Wow. So he carries a craft beer oh, selection. Cool. Oh, you nice. guys have got to get cool. together. You have to get a collab. You know, seriously. You know, think about it. You know, these, these places, they're sitting there vacant off of these exits. I mean, they're actually in good locations. Restaurants in general tend to find great locations. So right. yeah. that and the zoning is perfect. You know, they already figure out the zoning. There's no churches or things like that you have to consider when you're opening a brewery in that area. So, so will you take, uh, the breakfast bar and turn it into like a Randall, your own beer, beer breakfast buffet. buffet thing. Totally. Yeah. Totally a beer buffet. We <laughs> yes, ripped out yeah. the buffet station yep. and we are putting in the coolers in the bar right there. Yeah. Man, have floor drains, power, water, everything you need. We just got to plop in a, a 14 by 18 cooler and we're ready to go. So Very cool. beer, pasta, all the same, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, what styles are you going to focus on? What can we expect so to get there? We're a, we're a hot focus brewery. So I, I, I tend to a lot of, I want to focus on, on hops as a flavor. I, I kind of like to think about hops as a uh, kind of like wine varieties. So, you know, we, you know, there, there's a lot of terroir that's, uh, uh, you know, with hops and, um, you know, I really want to express that in the beer. So we'll do IPAs. We'll do hoppy lagers. We're going to do hoppy saisons. Uh, we'll probably do dry hop say, uh, sours. I mean, you know, anything to express the flavor components. And, you know, it's going to be a little balanced down there in South Georgia because people down there aren't used to these flavors. But, you know, I'm talking to the, to the people down there. They're really ready for a craft brewery. So I'm excited to get it going. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, guys, yeah. thanks so much for joining it. We Joining us, we really appreciate it. Uh, to keep up with the progress of Hop Soul Brewery, follow them on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, if you want to see what's happening with Elkmont Exchange, like them on Facebook, follow them on social media, or visit elkmontexchange.com if you're in the knoxville area be sure to check out their beer and all those delicious cured meats absolutely was it all one sentence it was <laughs> it was totally fired out there, man. let them know about it awesome well thanks so much that about wraps us up for the beer guys radio show we appreciate everyone tuning in there please remember to subscribe on itunes stitcher wherever you get your podcast if you enjoy the show consider supporting us on patreon it helps us out a lot Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers.